Good afternoon. Uh, good morning for some and good evening. I see we've got folks on from across the globe. My name is Dan Barker and I'm the Managing Director of the Halcyon Incubator. And for those of you who don't know Halcyon, uh, we accelerate the impact driven future of business by supporting early stage ventures from across the globe that have an impact at their core. And I'm so excited uh, to moderate today's conversation uh, as part of the Skoll World Forum's ecosystem today on the impact-driven future of business. At Halcyon, we've always believed that impact-driven businesses not only represent an important opportunity to drive equity and to build shared prosperity, but then in the long run, they'll outperform their traditional competitors. And the last few years have taught us anything from both the research as well as our collective lived experience, uh, that thesis has proven to be true. The calls for more sustainable, and more equitable economies are growing and would only continue to be amplified as new social and climate crisis, crises unfold. It's now clear more than ever that businesses and indeed capitalism itself can't survive without being impact driven. During a recent event that we held here at Halcyon, Skoll's president, uh, Marla Blow, talked about how we couldn't unsee all of the injustices that all of the injustices that have become so clear uh, over the last few years, and that business couldn't remain on the sidelines. It's obvious that business needs a sustainable and successful society in order to thrive. So what we need to do today is have a conversation about how we drive that sustainable and impact-driven business. We know markets are paying, att markets are paying attention Billions of dollars are flowing into ESG investments. Uh, many startups are, uh, who are impact driven have become unicorns. Uh, but we see clear gaps in getting support to the cap and capital to entrepreneurs from across the globe that are closest to the problems that we face. So I'm really excited to jump into this conversation with this phenomenal panel about what we've learned over the last few years, uh, where we go from here, and how we build a future where impact driven businesses are the norm. I'm thrilled to be joined by Priti Bhattacharjee, Head of Sustainable Investing at the U.S. Private Bank of J.P. Morgan, Tendai Kahende, CEO of Lydia, a fintech lender that allows high-impact businesses in Africa and Europe to access, access credit they need to grow and scale, and our own Dana Goldstein, Chief Investment Officer here at Halcyon. And we're going to jump off this conversation uh, with a few moderated uh, questions, and it's really meant to be engaging, so put all of your questions in the chat. Uh, and we're going to start by trying to get through a little bit of the jargon. Um, we've heard over the last few years, a lot of terms pop up. We're reimagining capitalism. We are driving purpose within business. Uh, we are looking at ESG. There's a lot um, that's happening, but I'm hoping our panelists can help us see through that jargon. Uh, and to start off, uh, how are you personally defining impact-driven business? And we'll start with Preeti go to Tunde and then uh, round out with. Morning, everyone. Great to be here. I'm Preeti Bhattacharjee, Head of Sustainable Investing for the US PB at JP Morgan. Um, I define an impact-driven business as a business that does more good than harm. And I am perhaps controversially leaving intention out of that answer. And we can talk about why that is if useful in the Q&A. Succinct, <laughs> Tunde. Hi, everyone. I'm Sunde, CEO of Lydia. Uh, we use data to identify well-run businesses, and then we give them credit, payments, and forecasting so they can grow faster. For us, our mission is to help great business owners build high-impact businesses. And we track that in terms of jobs. We track it in terms of uh, economic impact. We track it in terms of growth. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, and I am so excited to be here uh, talking with you and talking with Preeti and, and Tunde. This is a, a really exciting and important conversation to be having. And the way that I define and that Halcyon defines impact business, uh, impact driven business, is a business that has impact at the core of what it's doing. It's not just how it's doing business, it's not that it has some ancillary benefits, it's that the way that the business is constructed. Whatever the impact is that it's trying to pursue, it is so core to the business model and so core to the financial model that when the financial model succeeds, the impact that the company is trying to create is created. Similarly, that when the company is driving impact, it is similarly driving financial returns. 
So we're really trying to, to push on the notion that there's anything concessionary uh, in driving for impact, that the financial returns don't come at the expense of social returns or environmental returns, but they, they come because of the impact that the company is trying to pursue. And thank you, Dana. There's, I think, an interesting juxtaposition or even intention between what you describe and what, what Preeti described, because she left out intention. I want to go back to Preeti to, to hear a little bit more about you know, what distinction you, you see in what Dana just described and why you purposely left out intention when you described an impact driven business. Yeah, and I, the, the good news is I don't think they're mutually exclusive. You know, I think anybody who's a reasonable person understands that intention matters. Um, I think in some cases, and this is clearly not the case with Dana, I think in some cases folks act like intention is all that matters. And particularly in the impact space, I think performance matters. I don't care what you're going to promise me. I care what you were going to do. And more importantly, I care what you've already done. And so as we think about impact in a business, you know, thinking about impact related track record, impact relating performance, whether it was intended or unintended, I think is increasingly the direction in which we're trying to push to really get a sense of what is the effect that you as a company are having on your, all your various stakeholders and how do we start to today's uh, point to measure that appropriately in an accountable measure so we can improve performance across the board, whether you intend to have in good impact or not. And you mentioned today, I'd love to bring him into this conversation as the one representing the one who is doing the, the, the who's driving the impact. How do you see the, the distinctions that are being uh, drawn here between that intention um, and obviously, you know, to produce concession, intention does matter versus sort of that action orientation. How does Lydia position itself within that spectrum? Yeah, so we view ourselves as agents on behalf of our customers. Right, so the whole idea, one of the big insights that we've seen is a big challenge when it comes to access to finances. Can you untangle the finances of a small business, quickly authenticate it and present it in a format that they can be assessed that they're actually a well-run business? That's where Lydia comes in. So we have the ability across multiple geographies to help you very quickly uh, untangle your finances, authenticate them, present them to lenders like us and increasingly to other lenders so that you can actually get the finance that you want to grow. And then we now focus on particular themes that we think are critical to a country, right? So we have certain things around funding food. So how can you help grocery stores access the finance that they need so they can sell safe quality food in your local neighborhoods? We have themes around funding banking 2.0 for mobile money agents in Africa that can do cash in, cash out, and we then provide the flows. So we view ourselves as we're always on the side of the small business. And our role is to understand if they're a well-run business and then give them all the financial tools they require to then get to the next level. Thank you. Switching gears a little bit, we talked started off talking about terminology um, and where we've seen the field uh, going particularly as the calls for more impact-driven business have grown. And one of the big aspects of that has been ESG investing. Um, and I'd love to turn over to Preeti and get, then get um, from the entire panel, but starting with Preeti, where is this movement for ESG helping us on this trajectory to making impact-driven business the norm and where is it holding us back? Yeah, it's a great question. And honestly, one that doesn't get asked enough. Um, so I will say in the interest of brevity, I've got four places where I think it's helping and two places where it's hurting and you guys can double click me as useful. Um, places it's helping, number one, it's changing the cost of capital. We've seen that in the data again and again and that's increasingly true. Number two, it's changing board compositions. We can have a whole conversation about the latest round of proxy votes that just happened, but board compositions are sh they're shifting. They have shifted in our lifetime and they will continue to shift more. Uh, helping number three, it's changing the questions that management get asked, particularly by shareholders. And number four, perhaps the one that I'm most interested in, it's changing the questions that management's getting asked by new recruits, by potential employees. I was in a job interview the other day where the prospect sat across the table from me with a copy of our MSCI report that was all marked up and asked me very specific questions about the company. I love that. That didn't happen 10 years ago. That's a function of the level of data availability that's out there. We can talk about the quality of the data. We can talk about all the, you know, the caveats there. But 
the the enablement of new recruits to be able to ask management at their potential company those questions i think is a function of where esg investing is, has taken us um, two downsides number one it is still back to data a wild west when it comes to impact data and we can talk about all the shortcomings of data there's a whole cottage industry that's been built around the shortcomings of impact data but that's legitimate it's real it's improving incrementally but there's a long way to go number one and number two, I think one of my biggest concerns with the ESG investing space right now is it often treats companies like there's a binary. They're good companies and they're bad companies. And I'm not sure that's a productive conversation. You know, Oscar Wilde said, every devil has a future, every angel has a past. I think that can be true of companies as well. And so thinking about companies, not in that black and white binary of good and bad, but thinking about a spectrum of performance and thinking about improving companies along that spectrum of performance, I think that would better serve the ESG investing space than the kind of binary conversation that we're currently having as a sector. Yeah. And Tindy, how have you seen this conversation evolve as, as someone who has been raising funds as a serial entrepreneur, um, thinking back to your Jumia days all the way to, to uh, Lydia, uh, how has this trajectory of ESG investing changed the kinds of conversations you've had with investors? Yeah, I know. It's, it, I love what Pritu said about the spectrum. Right? They literally, from I've been running businesses now for close to ten years, and ten years ago, this was not brought up at all, right? And you know, we've now raised funds from folks like Axion, from Bamboo, from Omedia. So they have that as part of their mission to say, look, uh, we care about doing well commercially, but we also care about doing good. And and I think things are starting to change by focus on the African continent particularly when it comes to the impact of regulation and the knock-on effects when it comes to ESG and other impacts. So for example, there's been a lot of great work done around mobile money over the last 10 years. And I think we're just now beginning to see the impact of that in the last 18 months to two years, you know, from COVID with cash now getting rapidly digitized. So it's begin, beginning to become clear, look, not only can I get financial services to the bottom of the pyramid, but I'm also now able to boost financial inclusion. We're able to digitize payments and that has knock-on effects around access to credit, access to insurance, thinking of taxes, thinking of improving business livelihoods. And I'm seeing it more and more in, in everyday conversation. And I think folks are also realizing that look, after a very tough two years, it is important that we're protecting a wide range of business owners, right? Like from the bottom of the pyramid all the way to the top, given how connected supply chains are and just given what we've seen in the last two years. So we are seeing it in almost every conversation now. Not only, not only do you focus on getting a return, but how can you use financial inclusion to also improve the lives of your customers? Thank you. And, and Dana, you're, you're focused on early stage um, and curious to, to get you in here to think about and to discuss where VC plays, where you pretty talked about every uh, every angel having a past. You're, you're, you're looking at ventures who don't have too much of a past. So where, what do, is the role of VC in helping to drive this movement towards impact-driven business? I think it's critically important. And I think we're seeing SE change on a number of, of levels. Um, just wanted to bring a little bit of additional uh, data into the conversation in terms of how employees, how customers, and to an increasing degree, how investors are thinking about the importance of business to address you know, I think we can all agree that there are very big societal challenges. We can agree there are very big environmental challenges um, that for a long time, uh, I think a lot of people have thought of as either the domain of government or nonprofits or NGOs to solve. That's in the midst of shifting in a number of ways. Um, and there's a, an annual report that comes out called the Edelman Trust Barometer um, that looks at um, the influence of trust across society to, to shape conversation and, and drive action. And the 2022 Edelman Trust Barometer uh, showed a really interesting trend towards more belief that businesses can actually solve problems. Um, and just to, to throw out two quick stats, uh, globally, the sense that institutions strength in taking a leadership role to coordinate cross institutional efforts to solve societal problems, 44% of respondents trust government and 55% trust business, uh, which is kind of shocking to me. Um, and then the, in the ability to get results to successfully execute on plans and strategies that yield results in terms of social and environmental action, 42% trust government and 65% trust business. So there's a sea change that's happening in terms of the perception of the role of business in addressing some of these problems. And we see it happening you know, at, at the level that, that Fritzi is working on, 
uh, in terms of ESG, in terms of the amount of capital that's going in that direction. So there's already a bit of a change in terms of the perceptual hurdle, which I think is in some sense is one of the hardest things to mobilize early stage capital into these businesses that have a different orientation. There's still a lot of work, work to be done there, but it, things are moving in the right direction in terms of saying there isn't actually a trade-off between financial and social and environmental returns. Um, so the getting early stage investors involved is absolutely critical. Um, but there needs to be an intentionality around sourcing these deals. Uh, you know, the today was talking about um, finding businesses that are, are doing, the, doing the work, that are helping their constituents, that are really providing necessary services. That's not necessarily in terms of the social impact where traditional venture has tended to focus. And there's an increasing shift, but there needs to be an intentionality around it towards saying, you know, the, a lot of venture is about pattern matching. It's about saying there was a company that did this and was wildly successful. Uh, so if I see a company that looks like that company, I'm going to be excited about potentially investing in that company. There needs to be an intentionality around looking for solutions in different places in terms of finding entrepreneurs who are proximate to the problems that they're trying to solve. In terms of finding entrepreneurs who are fairly bold about saying, yes, we're about maximizing shareholder value, but also we're about maximizing stakeholder value while we're in the process of serving, uh, our, serving our mission and driving returns uh, for investors. Um, so there's an opportunity, you know, there are uh, organizations like Halcyon, but there are lots of others out there that are really working with entrepreneurs who are at the very early stage in addressing problems and taking very big swings and making very big bets to drive financial returns, but also be something that's gonna be incredibly meaningful. And there's a, a bit of a broadening of the aperture that I think needs to happen at an early stage. Uh, to help those uh, help those companies get access to the capital they need. And Tunde, building on Dana's point, I'm curious to hear about your experience as a founder, um, maybe not necessarily working in a place when you started out 10 years ago, uh, that matched the patterns that, that Dana just referenced. Um, describe for us a little bit of what that experience was and what you think needs to change in, in that experience that you had and, and as uh, we look to as VCs and other investors look to approaching those folks who like you who are approximate to the problems that you're trying to solve, uh, reflect on that experience and, and give us some advice on what needs to change from that perspective. Yeah, I, I thought Dana's point was 100% spot on, right? Uh, in terms of pattern, pattern matching, because and, and sometimes as entrepreneurs, we, we push the innovation and how different we are. But the reality is we also have to learn to articulate and speak the language that potential funders um, speak, right? So it, a lot of times as operators are very close to our businesses and we describe our businesses in very particular ways. But I'm learning that it takes uh, a village, right? To solve this problem, right? So there's roles for the, for the entrepreneurs, there's roles for the regulators, there's also roles for the funders. And what I've seen is if, you, if we can get to a place where we are all sitting on the same table and we're able to in a trusted environment, really explain what we're doing, and I think start with the customer because everybody always understands the pain point the customer is going through and look at funders as a partner. That's what entrepreneurs like me are looking for to say, look, I, I know in Nigeria, the SME credit gap is close to $100 billion. I know around the world in the last two years, you're seeing businesses saying, look, I am having to rapidly digitize. I am dealing now with multiple partners when it comes to payments, when it comes to cash management, when it comes to credit, when it comes to other treasury services. So I'm looking for all-in-one finance. Uh, can you help me? And can we now be able to translate that story of that you know, grocery store owner explain to a funder who is seeing the same thing happening in the States, seeing the same thing happening in Latin America, and now say, look, this has succeeded in multiple markets. We can back these entrepreneurs in these emerging markets. And guess what? Not only is there a a likelihood of a financial return, but also you are going to have a huge impact, right? And I'll leave you with a statistic. I think I saw a number this week that said non-cash payments in Africa are 5% of total payments, right? That is only going in one direction. And you can imagine what that means for the person that's able to help these entrepreneurs digitize these payments. So I, I fully agree with Dana's point. I think that's what I'm talking Briefly, from the institutional perspective, Dana talked to uh, VC, and I think Tony referenced sort of multiple investors who potentially uh, could change. He referenced the need for entrepreneurs to maybe talk, change the way they're speaking to investors. 
how do investors need to, uh, particularly institutional investors need to change the way they're thinking and speaking uh, in this space? How much time do we have? <laughs> um, so I think our job as capital allocators is to learn to be fluent in the language of entrepreneurs and, and management in general. Um, you know, Dan, to your initial point, it's companies and enterprises that actually make an impact and as capital allocators, we're allocating between them. And so I think we need to be meeting management more than halfway, frankly, that's a burden that we should be carrying. Um, at the tip of the iceberg, I think is all of the various ways in which implicit bias shows up in the institutional allocation of capital. Uh, and that particularly shows up when you think about gender bias and when you think about racial bias, you know, there have been so many conversations in the institutional investing space, but also still not enough conversations about the uh, the types of screens that keep communities of really um, high potential entrepreneurs out of the conversation. So for example, the standard institutional practice of needing a really long track record of performance before willing to allocate capital. Like that is, I, I suspect everybody on this line knows the ways in which that can actually really skew your pool in a way that um, uh, will marginalize, further marginalize particularly minority uh, either on a gender basis or on a racial basis entrepreneurs. And so, you know, I hear you asking about how we need to change our language. I think the language is deeply interwoven with the practice. And I think that's about really re-engineering and rerouting practices so they're appropriately centering entrepreneurs and centering management um, as opposed to centering the capital. And I think that there's a lot of work ahead of us for that. I'm sure Tunde would, would agree in terms of centering management in that process, uh, as well as Dan as a, as a uh, serial entrepreneur herself. You know, I want to go back to something, Preeti, that you started off talking about was the the wild, wild west of measurement here, right? And and I think everyone should will have a perspective on this. But starting with you, since you brought up the the topic. Help us understand what currently exists um, and how, again, to the point about ESG, how it is or is not uh, helping us move in this movement and what needs to, be, to happen in this space. We know that there's lots of different ways to measure currently, whether you're looking at SASB, GRI, looking at uh, uh, impact measures like Gen Iris. Help us understand kind of that ecosystem and what needs to evolve and change, particularly as we see regulatory movement in this space. Yeah, a great question. Um, so I think the very first challenge is making sure we're all clear about what it is we're trying to measure. And so I think generally when we're talking about impact measurement, there are kind of two buckets that we're generally talking about. We're either talking about financially material measurement. So what is financially material to the business? Or we're talking about a values oriented set of measurements. You know, regardless of whether or not it's financially material, this is a set of measurements that we've decided for some reason or another on a values basis is important to us. And so when we're looking at financially material measurement, you know, think about the standard that's set for financial reporting. Good financial reporting is historical, audible, and comparable against peers. Impact reporting at the moment is kind of none of the three. And so it's not usually historical. Often it's, it's, it's forward-looking promises and pledges. Uh, it's usually not audited by any entity other than themselves. It's self-reported, which means folks get to report whatever makes them look good. Uh, and it's certainly not reported in a way that's comparable against peers. I think to your point, there are groups that are doing really valiant work around that. I think SASB and GRI and these other bodies of work are really working on standardization. I think the new SEC uh, report that came out last week is going to help push towards more of that standardization. But on the financially material side, I think if you care about impact reporting, it should be held to the same standards as financial reporting, historical, auditable, comparable against peers. Completely different from the impact reporting, by the way. So if you're looking at values-oriented impact reporting, I will actually say one of the concerns I have in the space is the number of organizations who frankly burden, particularly early stage companies with pages and pages of impact metrics that they want reported that are in no way financially material, but just make them feel good. So back to centering management as opposed to centering the philanthropist or the investor, you know, having an actual conversation, like a relationship-based conversation with management around what metrics do you think we should be monitoring? Here are the metrics that matter to me. Let's come to an agreement on, around a reasonable set so you're not layering all of this additional reporting onto companies. That is, by the way, expensive and cumbersome and often not even useful. And even within the value space, I don't think it needs to be a financially material lens, but there needs to be a materiality lens. What are you gonna do with this information? You know, if I'm gonna spend all this time and all this money reporting all this data to you, what do you do with it? Do you just, does it go into a file somewhere in Microsoft Word and an archive, or does somebody actually make decisions based on it? And so I, I think the challenges on the financial material and the impact driven side are different, but there are plenty on both sides. 
And Dana, how does that translate for you as an early stage investor, right? We were, uh, Preeti mentioned asking for lots of impact measurement. How do you think about what you ask for, um, what you look to see um, from the ventures that you're looking at? Um, and what do we think about, and what do we think is necessary for early stage ventures? Social impact measurement is something that we focus on here at Halcyon as part of our incubator. Uh, so if you could look at it from both sides as with your investor hat as well as the incubator hat on. Absolutely. And I, I just, I, I'm smiling because I love the way that uh, Preeti framed that um, partially because uh, I have a background in philanthropy as well. And there is a lot that happens that is more about uh, the capital allocator getting the information that they need that isn't necessarily actually actionable uh, versus what is important from a management perspective for the entrepreneur to be able to know that they're doing what they're trying to do. So we, we take, you know, uh, we, we don't have a standard set of metrics that we're saying you're an early stage impact driven entrepreneur. These are the things that you should be measuring because every early stage business is going to be a little bit different. Uh, we're industry agnostic at, at Halcyon and our investing is industry agnostic as well. So we're not saying, you know, every company should be measuring uh, CO2 reductions because that's not necessarily going to be relevant to every company. So a lot of our work is around understanding and working with entrepreneurs to understand what it is that they're trying to accomplish, how what it is that they're trying to accomplish is baked into their business model, uh, and then how to measure the specific things that they're doing in ways that are meaningful for them to be able to know that they are effective. If they're effective at what they're doing, being able to construct something where they can share that information with prospective investors uh, with, you know, and, and being able to track that information as they grow, um, that process gets a little bit easier versus saying here is a standard that you as a very early stage business where you may only have a product on the market, you know, it's, it's maybe only been on the market for six months. Um, there needs to be a bit of an assumption of these are the things that I, as an entrepreneur, I'm trying to accomplish. These are the ways that I think that I'm going to accomplish them. Being able to then test those assumptions once the product is in the market, once there's actually feedback coming in from customers, coming in from other stakeholders and tweaking along the way. Um, but it's critically important for that to be something, in our view, that is tied to how the company is doing business, not something that's ancillary to how the company is doing business. And Tim, how are you applying this idea that Dan just talked about, focusing on the things that matter to your business, to the, the folks you're trying to impact? How does Lydia, uh, how does that show up for Lydia? And also, what are you hearing from your investors in terms of what, what you should be reporting back? And is there any uh, misalignment uh, to, to put some of Preeti's earlier points in terms of what's actually really materials for two from both a financial impact standpoint? No, it's a, it's a very important question. And, and I love uh, how, as, how Preeti framed it because um, we are fortunate in that we have quite experienced investors who've done this for a very long time, right? Across different sorts of businesses. So from microfinance all the way to uh, FinTech, and I, I've learned that it's a conversation, right? Because as an entrepreneur, you have to basically focus on particular things. Entrepreneurs are focused on uh, getting to product market fit as quickly as possible, understanding if I have enough cash in, in the bank to last me for the next to the next milestone. So we're typically laser focused on that. But I've also learned that for your um, capital provider to do their part, their part, which is to uh, lay the groundwork for your next fundraise or for a next line of credit. It's a conversation to say, look, in my world, here are the metrics I need to see so that I can make sure when it's time for your Series A or your line of credit, you are best positioned to succeed. And I think it's, it's that trade-off to say, look, in a resource-constrained startup, what are the things that are very, very important to us? And are we being very thoughtful to say, look, do we really need 50 KPIs, or does it make sense to show uh, at this stage of the business, these five metrics are very indicative of what we're all trying to achieve. And then when we get to the Series A, if we're now going to remove some or, or add one or two, I, I think it, it has to be that, con that conversation. Um, and I think the, the last thing I would also say is um, the common thread I've seen is any feedback from the customer whether it can be anecdotal, it can be data, is typically what's really unifying, right? Because I think we're all trying to see the truth to say, we are attempting to offer a particular product to this customer. What are they saying about it, right? So, uh, so as, as, we, as we can gather 
synthesize and present that data. I think on the customer that goes a very long way. And then we can now say, look, what, what are the other holes around that that we now need to fill? If I can jump in with one additional comment, and this, this may not need to be explicitly stated, but I'm gonna explicitly state it anyway. Um, for impact-driven businesses, having a focus on impact doesn't mean taking the focus off financials. So as much as we're talking about impact metrics and measurement and what's appropriate at an early stage or appropriate at a later stage, the need for financial KPIs doesn't change. So investors at even at our stage, super early angels, maybe the first institutional funding into a company are still looking for the same types of financial metrics, the same type of measurement and the same type of progress that any other early stage venture would have to provide um, both to potentially receive investment and on an ongoing reporting basis. And Dan, to that point, there's there's a lot that's wrapped in there, right? In terms of helping folks who are at that earliest stage understand those fundamentals that you just described, understand the language that, to attend to this point that the investors are speaking, and then adding on top of that impact. Uh, and what we started off talking about was that there are a lot of barriers for folks just generally because of pattern matching and because of access. Um, and then for the folks who are closest to the problems that we all described wanting to solve sustainability issues, issues of social and economic inequality, how do we understand that there's all of these things that a, uh, an entrepreneur needs to do in order to, to meet the, the threshold of being an impact driven, an investable impact driven business? How do we pair that up against some of those access challenges that we see? And I'm going to actually start throw it back to you, Dana, to, to start, but would love to hear from the entire uh, panel about what are some of the steps that we have to take to understanding all those critical things that need to happen, but actually helping folks achieve all of those um, important inputs that you just described for their business? I, I have two, two quick thoughts, and then I'm curious to hear uh, what my, my co-panelists have to, to add to further the conversation. Um, the first thought is maybe a little bit self-serving, um, but an incubator like Halcyon, and there are others out there, uh, that is very intentional about supporting entrepreneurs who are proximate to the problems that they're trying to solve uh, can help in the incubation process before a company is seeking investment to address some of those critical questions. Um, the other thing that I would say is that for early stage investors who really want to be intentional about this, who are looking for opportunities, part of the, the thing that's exciting about early stage impact investing is in part because of the structural inequity at the moment, finding the right early stage impact driven deals those are deals that other people aren't looking at, which from an investor perspective is actually potentially very exciting. But I think to be intentional about it may also require being a little bit patient and saying that the, the first conversation uh, with a founder may not be a conversation that leads to investment. If you see the potential in the venture, if you see the potential in the entrepreneur, getting involved and being willing to, to be a bit involved with that entrepreneur to help uh, clearly communicate, to give the feedback, you know, hey, we're not seeing these things that we would like to see yet here are some thoughts about how you can put those things into place and then come back to me in six months, nine months, whatever the case may be, show me the progress that you've made. Uh, similarly, here are the resources. So I recognize that you haven't had access to X, Y, and Z. Um, here are some things that may be accessible to you that will help you tell both your financial story and your impact story better and better position you for conversations with folks like me or with other investors going forward. You mentioned self-serving. It might have been a self-serving question for me to ask, but I still think it's the, the, the right answer. Preeti, you know, from, from your perspective, um, how do we think about closing the, this gap in terms of access knowledge for the folks that we're trying to serve in terms of those that are approximate to these problems? Yeah, I, I think the first step on our end is to, first of all, acknowledge that there is a gap that a lot of the times the folks that are getting capitalized are not even in the impact side are not people with lived experience around these issues. Um, and I, I was in a, I, I remember sitting in a panel a few years ago and there were four panelists and they were talking about the importance of employing working women and having an attractive workplace from a culture standpoint around um, being supportive of, of working mothers in particular. And I'm staring up at these four panelists and all four of them are men. And it was this really like jarring moment. I remember sitting there being like, look, even if they're saying all the right things and they're the best allies in the world, they don't have lived experience in what they're saying. How on earth did they not bring a working mother up there to discuss this from her perspective? It was just absolutely bizarre. It was this disconnect. I want us to have as allocators, I want us to have that reaction every time somebody walks into the room with an impact fund. Every time somebody comes in with an affordable housing fund asking, has anyone here actually lived in affordable housing? 
any anytime anybody actually comes in with even an impact fund of any kind, ask who here has lived experience relative to this issue. That's frankly not a question that gets asked in a lot of rooms right now. I think that's even step one. And then steps two through 10 are what Dana alluded to, which is like, okay, then once the answer is no, because it's often going to be no, how do we actually start getting to a place where the answer can be yes? But I think in our side, our obligation is to start just acknowledging that and frankly asking the question because it rarely gets asked. And today I want to throw this over to you because to, to Preeti's point, we see a lot of this uh, in, uh, in the continent, right? Where there are a number of folks who are getting lots of investment um, who've got great ideas, but not ideas that are necessarily different, but they're not actually from the continent. Um, and you see kind of this ju juxtaposition from your perspective, what needs to change and, and how that, that capital is being allocated and how we're actually driving that capital to the folks again, who, who, who have been living these, um, these problems and uh, have the lived experience that Preeti referenced. Yeah, no, it's, it's really hard. It's really, really hard. And for one thing I'm learning is uh, the first step is even within your own company, getting everyone on the same page, right? So literally from board member one down to employee number X, is everyone on the same page in terms of the mission that we're going after, the customer we're going after? Are we on the same page in terms of what we're trying to achieve over the next six to 12 months, et cetera? That is very hard to do, right? And, and, and I, and it, but it's important because if we're all together, if you have pick a number, 25, 50, 100 people singing from the same hymn sheet within their own portfolios, whether it's the operators running the company, whether it's the folks who are vendors, whether it's the customers, whether it's the capital providers, I found you can be very successful, right? Because then everyone knows within their own stakeholder community, look, we need to be able to catalyze a hundred million dollars to this entity because they are doing one, two, three, right? And so that is, but that is where it starts from. It's, it's extremely hard to do. The second point that I will also um, say is exactly what Dana said around financial metrics, which is we also have to show and prove the case that there have been big successes, right? We have to be able to say, look, this entity came into this region at this time, had this much in terms of uh, capital investment. Here, the impact metrics, which we'll agree are strong, but also here is the financial return, right? So there are not only theses, there are now four, five, six case studies of big returns. And I think we've all seen that capital flows to where they can get a return. So I, that's what I've, uh, come to accept. Thank you, Tunde. I, I have so many more questions for you, but I do want to turn to some of the questions we've got in the chat. And as a reminder, folks, you, you can put your um, your questions in the Q and A. Um, started first question addressed to Preeti um, around this question of toggling between your earlier or your earlier comment around judging between companies um, and sort of understanding that folks have a past as well as, um, you know, as well as a future, but how do you make that judgment, right? If you're, if you're not ever judging sort of the, on the history and we're not trying to fall into the habits of the pattern matching of the past, um, what are the bases for, for those, those kinds of judgments that you're thinking through? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'll start at a high level and say, honestly, I think it's more art than science. Um, which is problematic in its own way, like art is where bias creeps in, I will fully acknowledge that, um, and that we're, we're navigating that tension live in the sector. Um, so I could tell you the way we operate. So the way we operate is we try to get as much information about a company as we can. And so that means anything that's publicly available. So anything and everything, if there's a data source about the company, we're trying to, we're trying to absorb it and analyze it. It also means doing reference checks, particularly reference checks in a community. Like if a, if a company is operating a community, folks in the community know what's up and like actually being plugged in appropriately with locals to ask those questions again as part of kind of the, the, um, the insight building process. And so some of it is getting information, as much information as possible, and then sitting down with the information and trying to piece it together. So you might be looking at a company, for example, that has a very thin track record, has decent employment practices, has mixed environmental footprint, is minority owned and specifically owned by a, a member of a minority community um, who comes from a historically marginalized background. And so with that data, you then make a judgment call. 
different people can come to different judgment calls with that data set, but step one is getting that data and then running that data through whatever your, your parameter is as an, as an investor, as an institutional investor, or as an individual angel investor. And so I, I can't tell you what the right judgment call is once you get that data, but I can tell you your job is to get that data and look for non-traditional sources of data when you're doing that. Part of the challenge we're describing is that the traditional data sets kind of bias you in one direction. Using non-traditional data sets, using informal networks, using relationship-based networks is also one of the ways in which you can help round out some of those traditional data sets to get, a, I think, a more multifaceted perspective before you make that decision. Dan, does that answer the question? Absolutely. But, and I wanted to, to double click a little bit um, or maybe you actually expand on it because we know that you are you are willing and ready to do that work. Um, I know that you've literally gone into the field um, to, to understand what's happening with your companies. How do we translate that willingness that we know for everyone on this call and probably everyone listening has into something that is more institutional, that is something that goes beyond the broad calls um, to, to look at environmental, social, and governance, uh, or to look at impact measures, to actually doing that work and actually reframing uh, from it's just the typical way, modes of analysis that we, that we are used to. How does the sector change so that it's not just you and, and your colleagues, but in a sector that's looking at businesses in this way? I think, I think it's a great question. I think part of that is about having a clear conversation around motivations. So. You know, I might be more impact motivated, and that is true, but you can institutionally care about this because it can help drive alpha. Like that is part, we are all here to make money. We're also here to do other things, but we're here to make money. And so forget about any of this impact investing stuff. In my prior life, I did traditional investing. Like you, if you can get an informational edge over your peers, why on earth would you not? And so some of it's about free framing it around that, this. This is not necessarily do-goodery. This is about informational edge. This is about alpha. This is about identifying undercapitalized talent. This is about getting in on that undercapitalized talent before anybody else is. And so to your point around how do you create institutional momentum around this, there ain't no institutional momentum like there is around alpha seeking. And to me, this is an alpha seeking play. Um, and frankly, we can talk about the numbers, but you see that in the numbers again and again and again. Folks who are doing the additional work, they're doing the official, uh, additional groundwork, they're doing the additional field work, they are getting alpha generation from it. And that should move institutions if nothing else does. And Dan, I, I would love to bring you in here because I've often heard you talk about, similar to, uh, to Preeti's point, that this isn't about altruism. Um, and you know, in the, the VC space, how do you how do you see? You know, is it a similar conversation uh, that Preeti just mentioned in terms of how we reframe uh, what we're looking at here? I, I think it is very similar. Uh, you know, obviously the, the the dynamics are a little bit different than an early stage versus a later stage, but I think it is fundamentally around finding opportunities that others aren't finding, being able to generate returns from those opportunities. And I think there are two facets to it. Um, one is that in the case of a lot of impact driven businesses, they're actually creating new market opportunities. I think it's true for, for Lydia uh, that, you know, anything, maybe not anything, but a lot of businesses that are serving the bottom of the period, pyramid are creating opportunities to generate revenue where there wasn't previously at least the perception that generating revenue was possible. So an actual new market and an actual expansion of a market creates opportunity in ways that traditional companies or that VCs that aren't looking for those opportunities are just going to miss. The other facet of it uh, is something that Preeti just mentioned, that it's about investing in undercapitalized resources. It's investing in resources that have the potential, but not yet the opportunity to the access to generate comparable returns. And you know, the idea of being able to get into a venture that has the potential to be a unicorn, or even if it's not a unicorn, something that's going to deliver great value, uh, but doing it in ways uh, that other investors aren't quite yet plugged into is actually super attractive to people who are looking for it. That's gonna get a little bit more complicated, frankly, as more people are seeing early stage investing as impact investing, as there's more attention being paid to these really underlooked entrepreneurs who are building incredible companies. But at the moment, some of it is about storytelling, some of it is about, and Tunde mentioned, it made this point earlier as well, that once there's data, once you can see that there are these big financial returns that are driven by these companies that are, and these founders who are otherwise overlooked, that helps to attract more capital, that helps to change the frame of reference that early stage entrepreneurs are using. And I, I promised that I was going to stop asking the questions and I started asking you questions again, but to go back now to the questions we have in the Q&A, a question for you, Dana, you, and you're just referencing 
of getting capital to these early stage ventures. And, and Lori had a question about sort of these non-traditional um, financial products and sort of what do you think the appetite is? And I'm sure that uh, both Preeti and Anthony they have a, an opinion on this as well, but starting with you, Dana, um, whether it's for giveable grants, employee ownership, um, what's the appetite for traditional capital um, to move towards things that are more aligned to the entrepreneurs and putting really that, that wealth building back into the entrepreneurs? I, I would say it's really varied, but shifting at the moment. Um, I know I'm personally excited about it. And you know, one of the things that we talk about with early stage entrepreneurs is that going the venture path isn't necessarily the right fit for every entrepreneur for a number of reasons. So depending on the particular entrepreneur's growth path and the company's growth path, uh, first of all, non-dilutive funding, if you can get it, is always attractive uh, from the entrepreneur perspective. It is also, frankly, attractive from the investor perspective. If you're able to use as an entrepreneur non-dilutive funding in the form of grants, recoverable grants, um, whatever the case may be, to prove some of your model, to do some of your R&D, and then at the point that you're seeking equity financing, you've already de-risked some of the early stage product risk. That's, that's great. In terms of thinking about things like um, revenue-based financing, that variety of thing, um, it, I think is really exciting from the entrepreneur perspective. I think there is increasing appetite for it from a capital allocator perspective. Um, I would say one of the challenges is that because of the nature of that type of financing, the returns are smaller. Um, and that's part of why it's attractive for, uh, or at least they're frequently smaller, that's part of why it's attractive for entrepreneurs. But from a capital allocator perspective, thinking about your portfolio of allocations, if you're structuring something like revenue-based financing or other kind of non-traditional forms of financing as part of your portfolio, they're gonna generate really predictable returns, even if they're not the hugest returns in your portfolio, that can also be really attractive. Uh, so I would say it's it's evolving, um, and uh, there, I'm, I'm I'm seeing more movement uh, in that direction. I'm curious what other folks are saying. I'm curious actually to bring Tunde into this conversation because he, as you represent both um, someone who's taken VC, but also provider capital to folks who are just starting out, right? For folks who are uh, small businesses themselves. So you're on both sides of this equation, really. And sort of how do how are you seeing this movement in non traditional um, financial products, even represented by Lydia itself? I'm seeing a very big shift, a huge shift actually. Um, because I think we're now beginning to see the data in a format that pretty mentioned it, right? Like you can see the data, you can authenticate it, you can trust it and you can now say, look, so for example, our customers, Lydia, these are our Lydia customers on a monthly basis, uh, send and receive close to a billion dollars worth of payments, right? And so, so this is real, right? So if you discuss this with any financier anywhere in the world, you now start to have a very serious conversation around, look, how can we provide financial services to you? And I think these markets are very interesting because you're operating in markets where digital payments are 5%, 10%, 20% of total transactions. And so you, you, have, you have almost no competition and it's a window of opportunity as all these businesses, these consumers begin to come online, quote unquote, and digitize, they are picking a new financial partner. And it might not be a bank, it might be a telco, it might be a fintech platform. And that's a unique opportunity for returns that one can argue is not present in um, a, a lot of parts of the Western world, right? So that's how we think about it. I, I think you have to as, you know, be blunt and understand who you're, who, who you're speaking to the large pockets of capital are looking for a return. And so as entrepreneurs, we have to be honest with ourselves and say, look, if, we, if we're seeking that capital, is there a clear path to a return? And if you don't see that, then you might have to look at alternative sources of funding to help you get your business to where you're looking to get it to. And Preeti, I know you're, you're always very clear-eyed about the, the newest trend, the newest innovation, the newest financial product. Um, what, what do you see in this space, and and, and what are you, you know what are you seeing as genuine and organizations like Lydia that are looking at data in new ways versus what might be more of a fad in these trends towards new new financial products? Yeah, I worry clear eyed is code for cynical, and that would be true. <laughs> um, so I think there is a lot more appetite, particularly among individuals. I think this is an interesting distinction between individuals and institutions. 
Um, I think institutions, in my experience in general, tend to be slower around um, innovative new vehicles. I think individuals are much more interested and feel empowered to take that risk in part because usually it's their money and they're willing to take that risk with their money in a way they don't necessarily feel they can if they're in a fiduciary seat for an institution. So I think that's an important distinction there. Um, I also think some of it has to do with the, as we think about the allocation space, um, the actual allocators, the advisors and the investors who work with clients, we can do a better job of having conversations with clients around, you know, over what timeline do you need this money back? Do you necessarily need it back on the artificial seven to year, seven to 10 year time frame that we've all decided private equity apparently needs to be? Or could you hold it for 12 to 15 years? Um, I think we need to get trained in having that conversation a little bit more thoughtfully for clients and a way to create more space for more innovation and more vehicles. Um, in part, because I'll tell you right now, the default is seven to 10 years, two and 20, like the standard fee structure, copy and paste, copy and paste, copy and paste. And that's certainly not good for entrepreneurs in all the ways we've discussed today. By the way, it's not always even the right fit for allocators depending on what that family needs, depending on what that institution needs. And so I think this is a learning process for everybody involved in the ecosystem around uh, learning to be more flexible, learning to do different kinds of matchmaking. And like I said, I think that's particularly true on the individual side and will eventually be more true on the institutional side as well. So we've had a wide ranging conversation and I'm realizing that we are actually closing up in on an hour. Um, and I could speak to the, the you three for another several hours. Um, hopefully next time over drinks, but really wanted to start to get your closing thoughts um, in terms of what is your challenge for the investor community based on everything that we just described. We've talked about a huge potential. Uh, we've talked a little bit less about the huge challenges, but I think we've all spent the last two years talking about the challenges, so we know what they are. Um, and we've talked about a few ways that this ecosystem needs to change. Uh, to be more focused on uh, entrepreneurs, more focused on management, and really the folks who are closest and most proximate to the problems. Um, but you've got one thing, right? You've got the one thing you want the investor community to walk away with, the incubator community, the entrepreneur support organizations to walk away with. What's that one thing that we start with? Um, and Tunde, maybe I'll start with you. So the words that come to mind for me are to dig deeper, right? I mean, we, we operate in markets where, you know, when you see the headline Nigeria or in Eastern Europe, you know, it, it, the easier path is to find a different business somewhere else. But, but I do think I want the investor community, you're having a lot of talented management teams and smart capital look at these markets. There's a reason why. There is a, a huge fundamental shift happening around cash to digital. And I think it's a once in a generation opportunity, right? So I challenge uh, the, the investor community to dig deeper, look at the data, and let's go build some amazing businesses and have some great impact. Love that. Preeti, thanks. It's funny, because I was gonna say something similar. I was gonna say, put in the extra work. Um, and put it in, not because you necessarily want to feel good about it, put it in because if you don't, somebody else will, and it's a competitive market. You know, especially these next gen clients are coming in, they're asking different questions, they want different things, I can attest to that. And so if you're not putting in the extra work, to attend this point, if you're not digging deeper, somebody else is going to be and they're going to eat your lunch. All right, we've got put in the work and dig deeper. Dana. Uh, I, I love charge. both of those. And um, to, I think, complement that, um, challenge your assumptions. The ways that you've been doing things are not good enough yet. Uh, and you're doing the things that you're doing based on assumptions that you're making. So take an active look at the assumptions that you're making and how they're leading you to miss out on some of these incredible opportunities. Um, and then dig deeper. Uh, I, I, that, those were, that was fantastic. I love this. this. This is honestly for, um, I'm not a communications professional, but the, I couldn't think of a better way to end this with these, these lines. We need to dig deeper, put in the work and challenge our assumptions. These are crystal clear uh, in terms of what we need to do moving forward and the charges that we have for uh, all for ourselves, really, everybody on this call. Um, and I'm 
excited to work with this community to to do all of those things thank you all for joining us and spending an hour of your time we know that you've got a lot of places your time is probably your most valuable asset and we talk about about allocation of those assets i really appreciate you spending it with us on this critical conversation and thank you to our audience um, at the end of a busy week at the end of uh, an incredible school world forum we really appreciate the engagement and the conversation and look forward to moving forward with all of you and working together toward that impact driven future. Thank you everyone.